to the Adler Podcast. I hope everyone is all good here. Today is episode number 66. I will soon be joined by Franco. He will be joining the podcast as well. Joe, unfortunately, cannot make it. He has an activity today. Um, but hopefully, we will be seeing him next week as he's got lots of films to talk to us about. As always, dear viewers and listeners in the chat, don't forget to leave a like if you are enjoying the podcast. Uh, we've got a long podcast today. I mean, I'm going to try and keep it as short as possible because we've got lots and lots and lots to talk about. Franco's coming in as well with a lot of reviews. Um, so I'm going to try and keep everything as brief as possible. Don't want this to end up into a two-hour, 30-minute podcast as it usually does, right? Um, so I'm going to try and keep it as brief as possible. So today we've got lots and lots to talk about, like I've said. Um, we've obviously going to start off, as we always do, by talking about all the different movies and series we've been watching. Um, then we're going to get into the trailers, as we always do. First trailer of the day is Furiosa. We're going to be having a look at the latest Furiosa trailer. And we'll be talking about the first look at House of the Dragon Season 2, which gave us not one, but two trailers in a very, very interesting marketing scheme, um, which we'll be talking about later on as well. Are you Team Black or are you Team Green? Let us know in the comment section below. Um, then we'll be talking about Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, the sequel to, obviously, the original Beetlejuice, which, well, is interesting. We'll be talking about that as well. Um, and we've also got a new Star Wars project. Obviously, that is the Acolyte, which we'll be talking about later on as well. I'll be interested to see what Franco thinks about this. Um, I've got a lot of thoughts about it, definitely about the Acolyte. So we'll be talking about that as well. Um, apart from the trailers, we also have some gaming news because this week we had the release of Dragon's Dogma 2. Now, Dragon's Dogma, the release for it has been mixed. Lots of good and some bad as well. We'll be talking about that in the new section of the podcast. And at the end of the podcast, as we always do, we have the review section. So we've got reviews for Stop Motion, Franco giving us his review for Stop Motion. We've got a review for Roadhouse, the new Roadhouse starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Conor McGregor. We'll be talking about that. Uh, we've got Quiet on Set, which is the documentary about the goings on, the horrific goings on at Nickelodeon, which Franco watched and he'll be talking about that as well. Then I managed to watch Three Body Problem. I didn't watch all of it, but I watched the majority of the series. So I'll be giving my thoughts on that show. No spoilers, of course. And finally, a review for the latest Ghostbusters film, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. We'll be talking about that in a later on on the podcast. So viewers and listeners in the chat, let me know how you're doing. I hope everyone is doing well this Monday evening. Um, we've got lots of films and lots of shows to talk about. Hello, Franco. How's it going, my friend? Oh, sorry. I got distracted for a moment. Hello to all our viewers and listeners. Welcome to the Adler Podcast. Hello. I got distracted for a moment there. I just finished the introduction, Franco. We're just going to go into what we've been up to. So if you want to go ahead straight in. Franco, how are you, first of all? And... How has your week been? What have you been up to? It's good. It's good. Um, um, nothing. My my mother had my, my mother had her birthday, so happy birthday to my mother first and foremost. Um, uh, what else? I've watched. Uh, I started Three Body Problem, watched Stop Motion, watched Quiet on Set, Childhood, <laughs> not mm, ruined. Ruined. Every eviscerated <laughs> i mean I, it's, I yes i'm making light but uh, the subject matter was not light at all um no otherwise otherwise like i'm uh, i'm planning to do something and i'm also looking forward to watch the april fools shorts that are going to be shown at the saint james and most probably, most probably, they're going to do another show because it is fully booked. But just in case, already, damn. Okay. Yep. Just in case, uh, guys, if you uh, keep your eyes peeled. Actually, I do have a ticket. So if anyone, if anyone wants to come with me uh, Thursday, we can <laughs> join in. 
be my date. <laughs> Francos plus one. Exactly. I do have an extra ticket, right? Yes, yes, you do. Exactly. I do have an extra ticket. So if you any one of you guys want to come want to come this Thursday, 4th April. Can we share the details on, on screen? Mm. What to share what, Franco? Um I think the po the poster we could share the poster. Mm, I don't have it prepared. One second, because I don't have Facebook on Edge. Do I or do I not? In the meantime, Franco, talk about what you've been up to whilst I look it up. No, that's it. That's it, basically. Um, uh, that's all I have. And also kept reading the book. Almost done. I'm looking for because I'm looking for to read another book right now of local history. So uh, I'm really trying to <laughs> to wrap it up. Otherwise, uh, that's it. Nothing, nothing much, I guess. So, in the meantime, whilst I look it up, I can uh, update our viewers and listeners on what I've been watching. Um, I should watch quite a lot of stuff this this week. Um, so, first thing I've uh, so I'll start off with the series. Um, I've been rewatching some of the old animated X Men series mm. uh, just to put you into the picture. We're talking about the old animated series, which is this coming up on screen now. So, old animated X Men series. The reason why I've been uh, rewatching some of these uh, episodes is because the new X Men 97 show has started on Disney Plus. Now, I haven't actually started the X Men 97 show, I'll start it probably this week. Um, I'm on uh, season four. I've been I've been watching random episodes here and there, the ones I know are good, just to refresh my memory because this is a long, 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 long time ago. <laughs> Very long, long, long time ago. Um, so I've been rewatching here and there. Um, it's 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 uh, some of the dialogue here and there is a bit iffy, but it, it's actually for an animated show made for kids, it's actually a very smart show. I'm impressed by, by how certain concepts in it are actually very, 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 very smart. Um, also, it's obviously, uh, considering the time period in which, in which it was released, it is, I think, probably a shock for the, for the people who cry woke to watch yeah. this show and be like, wait, <laughs> this is Hold really up. woke. Hold Hold up. Up. <laughs> By the way, this is 1992 to 1997, but this is really woke because it is all about diversity, all about you know different people and people being afraid of what's different to them. Um, so I'd like to see some reactions from people who are in the you know the the whole woke calling brigade, uh, <laughs> and, you know those the classic people we we all know and love, and to see their reaction to to them rewatching the old X. -Men. I've already seen a lot of people calling the new X Men '97 woke. Um, of course, it is right. of, so it means they haven't seen the old one then. <laughs> um, but I mean, if you watch the old one, and I'm rewatching it now, it is incredibly woke. It is incredibly woke. <laughs> when it was an entertainment, it's an entertaining watch because this, the characters are great. I love Rogue. Man, I love Rogue so much. Uh, there are some great characters here, um, some great character work. I think the animation for the time, obviously, is, is also very good. Obviously, now, I mean, it's more or less garbage, but 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 back then, it was impressive, right? No, so it's been a good time watching the the old X Men episodes. Um, I've been watching Tree Body Problem, which we will review oh, okay. later on. Which um, episode? What I'm episode? Are you on? I believe I'm on five or six. Five or six. Already. Episodes. Already, yeah, 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 I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still at the third. Let's try your so, uh, it. We'll review it later on, um, and finally, it's come to an end. Phew. Uh, <laughs> season two of Halo, and I am so disappointed. Listen, Again? I know there are some people who have said that episode, that this episode, kind of like saved, um, saved the season. It's not bad. It's not a bad episode per se. But there's lots that disappointed me. Um, it's now. This, I mean, I don't think anyone on the podcast is watching Halo season two. But in case you are, I'm just going to say some elements of what happens in the final episode. Um, for me personally, it was decent, but still rather disappointing because of how good the source material is. Um, there is a whole battle between Master Chief and the Arbiter. This is not the Arbiter we get in the games. This is another Arbiter. Um, hence why Master Chief kills the Arbiter in this one. Um, now, the issue I have with the whole fight is the CGI is actually quite decent. Um, it actually made an appearance, Franco, on... Corridor Crew. 
on corridor crew. Yep. Um, and I agree with some of what they said. The CGI is decent. Uh, obviously, they they most of the scenes where there's a lot of CGI are shot in the dark with lots of smog, clouds, whatever, to obviously to help, because of, after all, this is a series. Um, now, my issue here is not the CGI per se, but it's the way it's shot. There is a lot of one takes. There are a lot of one takes in, mm, in, mm, in this mm. show. Sometimes they work. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes they work. But in Cor on the episode of Corridor Crew, they really pointed out one scene where they try to keep the one shot going. And the CGI just looks really off for a second. The scene just, you know, it, you can really tell. Um, because they put in the effort of trying to make it all one shot. Now, I appreciate one shots. When they fit, they can make for some really great scenes. Um, but some of the action here is too shaky cam. Too much shaky cam. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. but this is a CGI monster. I know they're using real, real actors. The real actors are doing the movement, and then obviously they're um, putting on the CGI onto the actor, right? Um, but but still, come on, that's that fucking shaky cam and whoa, moving around. Come on, this is a CGI monster. Just give us clear action. That's one thing I want to say. We also have the flood. Now there are elements of the flood that I like. Um, the way it started, however, was shocking. The way it started was shocking. I thought I thought there was something playing in the background because at one point I was watching it on my computer, right? Which is mm -hmm. why this happened. So I, I, I'm watching the episode and suddenly this like weird music starts off. And it's like music you would hear on like a romantic comedy. <laughs> but in a way, it fits, but in a very weird, very weird way. Because you've got this this supposedly, you know, scientists, smart scientists, and we'll be talking about smart scientists in the reviews later on, um, who touches an alien artifact. Now, first thing I would assume you would do if you are a smart scientist is not touch <laughs> an <laughs> alien artifact with your bare hands. That's one thing. Oop, one second, because my camera is off. Uh, not touch, not touch, uh, you know, an alien artifact with your bare hands. I think that is the smart thing to do. But if you do, I would assume you at least <laughs> wash your hands, right? And what does the smart scientist do? Starts to go around, eats an apple, touches lots of people and lots of places, and obviously that leads to the spread of the flood. Now, I accept there are a lot of stupid people around the world, <laughs> but to have something as important, as significant as the flood in Halo take place because of the actions of a stupid scientist for me just doesn't fit, right? Considering how well the flood is portrayed in Halo Combat Evolved, which is which are these like horrific monsters with where in the in the first Halo game it's a pure action up to that point. Suddenly it's pure horror. It's then the, the transition from pure action to pure horror is beautiful. And I expected them to do this. Unfortunately, they went with a different a different approach, right? With the weird music going on in the background. I forgot the name of, of, of the, the scientist, but anyways, the Janine. Yeah, Janine, Janine, Janine walking around and touching everyone. I don't know. Once the flood started, however, I thought it was well done. I think the horror was done well. Uh, I think that was all fine. But I really found it very generic. And it's, and I'm going to end my thoughts here. It's the problem with the whole show, right? With a sh show with such strong source material, the Halo series is extremely generic. Um, we have Kai's sacrifice as well, which led to no emotions, which was disappointing. And just everything in the final episode felt really rushed, which is which is a pity. I watched episode five of Shogun, um, which was great, as always. I think this episode slowed down the action a little bit, but in a beautiful way, because the character development we get in episode five is stunning. I, like we see, I, yeah. I, I, the, well, yeah, fuck it, finish <laughs> time. What happened? Uh, because I'm still not, uh, I'm still not at episode five. We're still, I think, we're gonna go on episode four. All right, okay, okay. But just to say, you know, yeah. amazing character development. Uh, the story pushes forward. We continue to see our beloved engine. Uh, Cosmo Jarvis integrating himself into Japanese society. 
uh, it's great. It's great stuff. There's great drama, great human yes. drama, great emotion, beautifully shot. There's one scene at the end which blew my mind how beautiful it was shot. This is serious TV at its best. And I think it's going to be very hard to beat this as the best show of the year, in my opinion. Uh, Although we have a lot of very good shows coming up and we've got a lot of trailers to talk about uh, later on as well. Uh, and I have, to, I have to say, I, I'm, I, I stand Anna Sawai. Eh? She's really, she, I have a big crush on her. <laughs> She's and really... Mariko San has an amazing, amazing um, scene in this episode. I, well. I haven't. Okay, okay. Mariko San, I haven't seen it yet. So. Ma Mariko. Ah, 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 Anna Sawai? Okay, okay, okay. She has an amazing scene in this. There is one scene which was very emotional. Her acting is so good in this. And really impressive stuff. Really impressive stuff. So that was my week. Viewers and listeners, let us know in the comment section below what you've been up to, what you've been watching. We always love listening to what our viewers and listeners have been up to. And with that, Franco, I think we can... Oh, wait, my movies. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I forgot to talk about my movies. I started to talk about my shows, all the shows, and I forgot to mention the movies. So, movies. Obviously, I had to watch the old, not the old, well, kind of old, now it's, what, two years? Mm, old, after life. Afterlife, now three years ago, released mid-pandemic. Um, obviously, in preparation for Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. And to be honest with you, Franco, I uh, had an okay time watching it. I had an okay time watching it. Um, it's a nice little nostalgic trip, you know, down memory lane. I didn't hate it. I know a lot of, some people liked it. Some people disliked it. I'm in the middle. I, I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. I gave it a 2.5 on Letterboxd. It's, it's, the issue I have with these two Ghostbusters, and I'll be talking about this later on, is how bland the visuals are. Like, mm. there's no color to them. They're all, like, the same color tone. Like, there's nothing pop, no popping color. No, the, the Mar the Marvel Marvel uh, cinematic. Right. Look. <laughs> it's an issue, right? It's an issue. It's it's a serious issue. Very looks very digital. Doesn't look very like, very, very digital. Very digital. Um, I finished the Crow, which I had started before the podcast last week. Okay. Um, beautiful, beautiful. I really, I'm close to saying I loved it. I'm, I had a, such a good time on Letterbox. I call it the real anti Marvel. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's how you interpret a comic book. Like beautiful and talking about boring visuals. Ah, Vesh van the Crow, beautiful, like visually stunning, amazing lighting. Man, wh where has that amazing lighting gone? Like very little. You see very little of it. You know what Corridor Crew commented about, and and I was I was impressed. I, I had mentioned it in my review as well. How good the lighting was on the Last Airbender show on Netflix. Yes, the comment yes, about yes, it, yes, how yes, very yes. good the lighting on the and that was one of the things I mentioned in in my review. The visuals on the on the Last Airbender series were amazing, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful visuals. Like the, I was the, the, oh, sorry, Franco, go ahead. That that scene with the earth bending was really was really well lit. Yes, like, yeah. yes, 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 yes. And the flames, the way the flames re reflect on the ground, those little touches make such a big difference. It makes it feel like you're seeing something that's really happening, although you know it's not happening, right? No, you know of it's course, CGI. of course. But that little bit of extra effort in the visual department. No, it goes a long way. And lighting. It goes a long way. Such a big difference. Such a big difference. Um, the Omen. I've I've uh, watched The Omen. I had never uh, watched The, the Omen. Uh, the, Original, the, Ocean, the 1976 the one. one. Um, it's okay. It's fine. It's, it's decent. Uh, I gave it a three out of five. Uh, considering it really is close to the exorcist, it's okay, nowhere near as good as the exorcist. You know, you know, what's funny because I saw, um, like uh, on YouTube, there was this video about cursed movies, and yeah. uh, apparently, uh, Gregory Peck, the writer and the producer, um, um all their their airplanes all, all were all struck by lightning <laughs> when they when they were going to the to the war to the talking about cursed movies truth. we are talking about the crow the crow was a cursed movie cursed that movie. was cursed ah betjamin i think that was one of the biggest cursed movies yes yes um did you watch this franco the omen 
No, I, I, I'm, I meant to have a look at it. There's also, and also the, the Crow. I think I have to go start watching some classics, man. I haven't been, wor- uh, I haven't seen some classics in ages. Like some good, time, eh? good, some good okay. black and white. I didn't love it. I think, I think it was a little too slow at times. Some very good moments of horror. Very, very good moments of horror. Some very good acting as well. Our main protagonist, Gregory Peck, obviously fantastic Peck, in this. Yeah. Um, some very good performances. The kid also is Jesus, really mm-hmm. creepy. Um, but I didn't love it. It was okay. It was a three out of five for me. I watched. I had never watched this. Shame on me. But finally, I corrected that network oh. with my family. I had never watched this, Franco. Oh, such a good time! Oh so God! Fantastic, fantastic uh, satire for the seventies. This must have been shocking. But unfortunately, in twenty twenty four, this is the reality we live in. Franco, that was my my thoughts on this. But, like Tarantino, Tarantino says, Petrovsky is one of the best screenwriters, and uh, he's not far. He's definitely not far off the mark. If you want to see something else by Petrovsky, mm-hmm. and you'd be very surprised that it's by the same screenwriter, Altered States, with Altered William Hurt. Altered States. Altered States. You'd and right. you'd you'd be surprised that this is by the same. Uh, okay, all right, interesting. Directed by Ken Russell. It's I I don't know. It's a uh, it's it's a bit like it's a trippy movie, yeah. So uh, okay, okay, interesting, nice. Well, I put it on my list. But yeah, I had a very good time watching Network, man. The, oh, such guy miss really good political satire. I mean, we've got a lot of political satire to be fair recently. To be fair, but uh, this was, this was but, very smart. But very, very uh, smart. it's it's not subtle. Eh? It's very pondering. No, um, but this isn't subtle either. Franco network is very in your face with its political satire. But what it's what is purpose, obviously? What 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 does it? What has this? Oh, I'm go. Uh, I'm going mad, and I can't take this anymore. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Everyone goes out from the window shouting it. Yeah. It's it's very on the nose, but obviously it's purposefully on the nose. Sometimes movies need to be on the nose with their message. And I think mm-hmm. this was very, very well done. And this is man, this is almost 50 years old uh, now. And still no, and, and and timeless. This is timeless. if you if, if you look timeless in the dictionary, you see network on there because yeah, exactly. it's completely still timeless. so relevant. And the performances in this are oh, so good, man. Peter Robert Finch. Duval, oh, so good, so good. Peter Finch, amazing. Faye Dunaway, um, may, I think she was one of the best in in this movie. Um, yeah. William Holden as well. Some such great actors in this, such such great actors, and they're all it's acting. Sidney Lumet, uh, yeah, Sidney Lumet. Amazing, amazing movie. If you haven't checked it out, viewers and listeners, I'm assuming many of you have. Um, please do go ahead and watch that. Worth it. Speaking of political movies, have you ever seen El Divo? Il Divo. Divo sounds familiar, but I don't think so. No, Wait. I haven't. No, <gasps> don't. This is one of the, for me. It's it's one of my like in. No, my I haven't watched this one. Hundreds by Paolo Sorrentino. All right. Uh, it's about Giulio Andreotti. Uh, it's a uh, it's a masterpiece. I nice. like. I'd rather watch this. Over and over again, excuse me. Then, um, then his uh, Berlusconi one, Laura, because Laura was really like, yeah. <laughs> there, was, there was, there was, uh, there was one scene where I laughed out loud when he's like, when you see all these like uh, ladies singing Benomalek and Silvio says, like, it was really <laughs> funny, but then again, it's like didn't hit as much as uh, Il Divo did. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. All right. So that's Il Divo. And then obviously I watched Roadhouse, which I'll review. And I watched Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, which, which I'll review later on as well. Frank, Roadhouse. you watched Roadhouse by any chance? No, 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 no. I didn't. I'll I review didn't, it. I'll review it. Roadhouse. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it later on. Well, with that, viewers and listeners in the chat, don't forget to leave a like if you are enjoying the podcast. Like I said, let us know in the comment section below what you've been up to because now we've got oh, such good trailers to talk about. True. It's really good. This week was crazy with the trailers. Really impressive stuff yep. with the trailers. And so, this one... Li- yes, viewers Franco. and listeners comment, whoosh, Roadhouse. 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 <laughs> Roadhouse, two separate words, mind you, not one. Yes, yes, yes. 
Roadhouse. Um, yeah. I can't, I can't help. So yeah, I can't help but thinking of the Family Guy <laughs> meme. This one, Franco, we've already commented about. We have a new Furiosa trailer um, starring Anya Taylor Joy as Furiosa. Audiences are about to witness the origin story of one of the most iconic characters from Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, long before she met Tom Hardy's brave hero. Warner Brothers has released a new trailer for Furiosa Mad Max Saga, the prequel that will follow a younger version of the character previously portrayed by the amazing Charlie Theron. Amazing yep. performance. The wasteland is not a kind place, and everyone must do whatever it takes to survive in the hostile environment. Um, obviously, we've got Chris Hemsworth's warlord Dementus, and he is truly demented in this, and <laughs> I am loving it. Thank you. I'm so happy an actor like Chris Hemsworth takes takes a role like this. I'm so happy and so proud of him. Uh, so finally, finally, they're 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 sort of like taking off the mantle of uh, yes. of Marvel. Eh? So it's like yes. we had we had uh, Robert Downey Jr. Who, who won an Oscar. We had Mike Ruffalo as well in Poor Things. Yes. Chris Hemsworth now with this one as well. Yes, so good to see. So good to see. Um, uh, obviously, this is directed by, written by, obviously, Miller, George Miller, um, Nick Lathuris, um, who worked with him also on Fury Road, which can only mean good things. Um, and that guy, from, do you remember Grease Rat Franco? Mm, from the original uh, Mad Max? Yeah, let's say, Grease yeah. Rat. Grease Rat. He, he was one of the characters, right? That is the writer. That's the writer working with George Miller on this. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, and obviously, Charlie Theron's interpretation of of uh, Furiosa was blew everyone's minds away. Apart from the four people who complained that the focus of the movie was more on Furiosa than on Mad mm. Max. I mean, the interpretation by Charlie Theron was be amazing. Like one of the most a massive powerhouse performance. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing Anya Taylor Joy's interpretation of the role. She's a talented actress herself, and I'm have high expectations for this. What do you think, Franco, about the upcoming Furiosa? I, I hope I hope Joe now like his doubts have gone uh, because the first time the first time we saw it, the teaser, people were saying, "Oh my God, this doesn't look uh, looks very how shall I say video gamey." But now mm -hmm. it, it's it's back to that kind of Fury Road, uh, intense orange, <laughs> very orange yes, yes, look. Yes. I mean, but it, the orange, it, it's its look. So I'm not gonna, you know, it's not. Uh... Who knows? I'm, I'm, I'm. To be of, to be totally honest, I, I, I'm ready to be surprised. Like I wasn't convinced with Fury Road, and then I watched it, and I loved it. It's the same. It's the same feeling here. But uh, I'm ready to giving it, to give it a go. I mean, I mean, it's action after all, so it should be uh, should be quite good, you know. Interesting to see George Miller. He's what eighty now, I think. Yeah, reached eighty, I would assume, right? Yep. Um, still giving us these massive epic action films. Am I, I the uh... only one in the Fury Road? In the Fury Road was overrated camp. Said Bruce McAuliffe, no. Yes, yes, you are the only one. <laughs> Andrea, Andrea is considering his life choices. <laughs> Bruce always, uh, always with his. <laughs> Bruce, no. this should be our next, our next thumbnail. Bros. And and, and, and Max Fury Road is the best action film we've received in the past 30, 40, 50 years. I don't know, but for me, it is up there amongst the best ever action movies ever made. Period. I, I don't know how can Stan, how can such a talented director not like such a beautifully directed film. I, I don't get it, eh, Bruce. I don't get how you can think it's Bruce, overrated. Bruce, Bruce's taste. I, <laughs> I, I like, you know, the mysteries of the universe. That's how. That's <laughs> how. That's how unknowable they are. His taste. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm sorry, but I am a massive, massive fanboy of the movie. I consider it as amongst the best action films ever made. Period. Like period. I love the originals. I have the Blu-rays of the originals. I adore the originals. But the Fury Road is just 
far and away for me one of the best i consider it probably amongst the best movies made in the past 20 years period in my opinion like just incredible incredible action action film. and we don't get that kind of action film that much anymore very one-offs very one-offs Apocalypto is that thousand. Listen, I love Apocalypto, Bruce. I am a big, 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 big fan of Apocalypto, and I I would put Apocalypto up there as another one of the best. I think uh, I think he like I've watched in the past twenty years. He like Out of Darkness then because it's a it's a similar vibe. Mm -hmm. I I I love Apocalypto. I would put up Apocalypto amongst as one of my favorite movies of the past twenty five years. Definitely, I adore Apocalypto. Um, it's a, it's a, the setting and the time period is, is my cup of tea. I love it. But I think Mad Max Fury Road is just up there as not only one of my favorite, but one of the best movies released in the past 20 years. Definitely. It, past 50 years. What the hell? Um, so uh, obviously I'm, as you can tell, very excited for Furiosa. Um, moving on to the next trailer, we've got Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. <laughs> no, Franco, it's going to be up to you here because I haven't watched the original. I missed out on the original. I have to rewatch. You I haven't have watched it. it. Nope, <laughs> I have not. I have not. So, let's introduce it. <laughs> A special thanks to somebody somewhere who tossed in one more Beetlejuice for good measure. Because just like that, the first trailer for Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice has arrived. Crossing over from the other side. Just a few months after it was reported that filming had wrapped on Tim Burton's spooky, scary sequel, Michael Keaton is back as the ghoulish hostess with the mostest in the star-studded follow-up that's been more than three decades in the making. I think the more death puns they put, the more money they receive, these Collider journalists. <laughs> it's showtime for Winona Ryder's Lydia. As one way or another, her path is about to cross with the undead by exorcist was scheming to make her his child bride when they last met. Luckily for Lydia, who now has a teenage daughter of her own, played by Scream franchise star and Wednesday's Jenna Ortega, Beetlejuice has moved on and betrothed someone more agent that appropriate will be played by Monica Bellucci. Looking forward to that. While until today, plot details have been as thin as the veil between our world and spirit world, we've long had a surprising wealth of information surrounding Willem Dafoe's new character, which came from the Portings actor himself who is apparently going to be playing a B-movie action star who woke up to find himself on the wrong side of the tracks between life and death, making the most of his new surroundings. The performer will take the tools he learned in life and become a law enforcement officer. Also included in cast, Catherine O'Hara, who replies her role as Lydia's stepmother, Delia Dietz, and the leftovers, Justin Thoreau. As of right now, Beetlejuice 2 is expected to rise into theaters on September 6th, 2024. So, Franco, you watch your uh, I'm. This is something <laughs> hot take. I'm not sold on this. I prefer the original. Again, it's a question of character. It's a question of you know. You know when you said that this that uh, sometimes it looks polished. Um, I'm over these nostalgia grabs. Like for frick's sake, my so, some. I don't know. I think my brother said like out of all these stories we're going back to these like uh, it seems like it seems like these companies most probably these companies uh, they they know that it's time it's time that these rights will expire so they do a sequel so they keep the the things going i think this is similar to the ghostbusters uh, thing you know after life and frozen empire like you 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 won't you won't recapture the magic you know I don't it know. It is very I'm... hard to recapture the magic. It is very, very, very hard. Burton on autopilot. Burton autopilot. Ex uh, I totally agree with uh, with Bruce. Like Burton now is a bit. Excuse me. Uh, Bruce, say. did you watch Wednesday? I don't. Know. And did you watch Wednesday, Franco? I'm not. I'm generally. I'm not interested. Generally, I'm not interested. Like uh, it was I really good though, Ta Franco. As in, forget all the memes and all the hype about it. I genuinely had a very good time watching Wednesday. Br Bruce, let's say it together. Wednesday is overrated. <laughs> I haven't watched it. You can't say. You can't say. No, I f I, I won't enjoy it. I know I won't enjoy it because it's uh, it it doesn't click with me. I even beat it. like when I saw the trailer. Uh, he enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. Uh, oh, Bruce it, was a, it was a good time. I had a really good time watching Wednesday. 
ignoring all the hype. I, I watched it when it released, so I had no idea about the hype or anything. Hype started, obviously, days after. Much I right, yeah, much right. Yeah. But uh, I, had, I had a very good time watching it. Hopefully, this is more of, of, of that. I mean, he's working once more with, with Jenna Ortega, who's a talented actress. That helps a lot, right? She does very good horror. So um, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that a lot. Jenna Ortega obviously was very good as well in Scream. She was very, very good in Scream as well. So uh, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I can't comment about this because I haven't watched the original. I tried to find some time this week to watch Beetlejuice. You, 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 you'll, en coming up. you'll enjoy it. I mean, the practical effects for their time uh, hold up uh, and again lots of character um uh, if you like the crow you like this one i mean okay. the retail shows is more on to towards the horror comedy obviously all right okay so those are our thoughts about beetlejuice beetlejuice and that comes out like i said i think end of summer i'm gonna summer? i'm i'm gonna give you a segue yeah it's uh, on it's going to be released on wait is that September the american September 6th. When Malta, yeah. God knows when in Malta, right? <laughs> so, um, however, speaking of nostalgia grabs, the next trailer looks quite interesting, quite enticing. And I'm assuming, Franco, you're talking about the Acolyte? No! <laughs> so, uh, I have alien. four trailers to go. Al alien, no, Alien. Uh... Oh, I didn't even prepare the Alien one. Oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I didn't prepare the Alien one. Coming up in a second. Because, True, then, because that was a very interesting trailer. I completely forgot about that trailer. It it feels like they're going back to the to the horror uh, to the sci-fi horror element of it, like to the the original uh, the the very first uh, alien, and with oh. Fede with Fede Alvarez on in the in the helm, since he did uh, Evil Dead, the new Evil Dead. I think we're gonna get some good uh, horror. Yes, I mean Fed Alvarez. I love his Evil Dead, his uh, evil interpretation of Evil Dead. And watching this trailer, you could tell this is a guy who knows his horror, who really knows his horror. And the atmosphere is great. So, first trailer for franchise relaunch Alien Romulus promises a return to the roots of the iconic sci fi horror series. Film comes from the director of Don't Breathe and Evil. I haven't watched, I don't think I've watched Don't Breathe and Evil Dead, Fede Alvarez yet has retained the director of the original Ridley Scott as producer and the Aliens director, James Cameron, as unofficial consultant. Um, oh my God, this was going straight to Hulu. That would have been such a big mistake. La, Thankful. La, la, la. Just la, the mess, how they messed up, Prey. Prey was such a cinema film released on Hulu, straight to Hulu, and that was such a big mistake. Big, big, big mistake. Because Prey was great, really good, really, really good. In the footsteps of the Predator prequel Prey, Alien Romulus is now heading to cinemas this summer with Priscilla's Kaylee, Priscilla's Kaylee Spini leading a cast of young actors. Kaylee Spini, very, very good actress. Uh, the timeline places it between Alien and Aliens and follows a group of young space colonizers as they go scavenging on a derelict space station. I wanted to travel back, not just to the style of the original movies, but to the genre of the original movies, Alvarez said to Variety. I really wanted to go back to the sheer horror of the first film and take those elements of trailer that aliens has an alien tree has as well we went to crazy extents to keep it pure to the filmmaking techniques of the first movie and we can really tell right franco watching yes, the trailer yes. we can really tell what do you think franco uh the, the the thing that i found slightly uh off because since i remember the watching the original i i i can't escape it but it looks uh it obviously it looks more polished. It looks more modern. That's that's the only qualm I have about it. But I actually look forward to seeing it. Or even even because, to be honest, lighting wise, lighting. Lighting. Ah oh, yes, yes. Lighting wise, like great contrast, and uh, I'm I'm happy that uh, that they're going back. They're going back to the original. Oh, the, the 2013 Evil Dead by Fede Alvarez was visually incredible. Like I the need... stuff he does with blood in that movie is incredible. <laughs> I need out I need... of this world. Well, then I have I still have to get to, to get around what to watching them, man. Um, There's the blood. <laughs> You're gonna have a lot no, of blood. Uh, this. If, but this if... moment, Franco, this moment was amazing when she said "run," and then yeah. you have that shot. Ah, uh, that scene. Ah. Uh, 
Lighting. You see how beautiful a movie can be yes, when you have good yes. lighting. <laughs> I'm going to become a prom- I'm going to create a movement. Bring back 70s and 80s lighting. Lighting. And this, this is what we want in a horror film. This is what we want. Good stuff. Good stuff. You know, here's here's another thing. I, I I found it strange, but then I mean, my again because my brain cannot cannot. Uh, I'm so used to the first alien to the first two aliens that I cannot process the fact that they actually those those uh, the face huggers actually run. And it's it's, uh, it's I I I have to skip over that because I feel that this will be quite the thrill, right? Thrill, right? There. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Have you watched any of the any of the newer ones? Uh, Prometheus. I know there was Prometheus. I watched I know Prometheus. There was Alien Covenant. I watched Prometheus. Prometheus was fine. I, I I didn't find Prometheus. I think I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind Covenant as well. I haven't watched Covenant. Covenant. Had some very stupid moments with people acting in a very, you know, rather, you know, oh, come on, you're a scientist. Please don't act this way. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to say this a lot today. Please, um, please don't touch alien shit. <laughs> <laughs> you we haven't even reached the review section of the podcast, but uh, uh, but uh, I think again. All, all these shows, all these movies, sorry, um, do the visuals quite decently. Do the visuals quite decently. And there is Fassbender, who I think is very good. Fassbender was very, very good in them. Bruce said he's a Prometheus fan. Yes, I liked Prometheus. I didn't love it. I liked it. It's a the, the, I do have to say that thinking about it, thinking back about it, the uh, like the way it, it tries to put to um, like make it part of the alien uh, universe was a bit added on. It felt like it was tagged on. To be honest, I, I wish mean, it could have been its own story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, the that's mythology the was interesting. The mythology was very interesting. No, very interesting, but it, it, that's that's the only thing I have with Prometheus. Mm-hmm. So, Alien Romulus, let us know in the comment section below if you're excited for this. I do know how I completely forgot about this trailer, but... Talking about 1970s sci-fi, minus the horror. <laughs> I can use this as a good segue for our upcoming series on Disney Plus, The Acolyte, because trouble brews for the Jedi. And this is a trailer that I have some thoughts on. Um, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, those iconic words mean a lot to us. But now we're going even further back in time with the upcoming launch of Star Wars The Acolyte, trailer for which has just made its way through hyperspace and onto our devices. Show will star Amanda Stenberg, a brand new series from the creator of Russian Doll, Leslie Headland. Trailer offered fans a glimpse at Lee Jung Jae as a Jedi master teaching a class of younglings at the Jedi Temple. Also Young featured Jay. the first. Really? Yeah. Young Jedi? Yes. yes. The first look at series star Stenberg as a masked warrior entering into scuffle with, and this I'm oh, so excited about, being a big, big Matrix fan, Carrie and Moss's Jedi Knight. Um, uh, and you can really tell she's still got the moves. Uh, she's still got the Matrix moves. Uh, yes. the High Repu- <laughs> she does have the moves. She does have <laughs> While the High Republic is an era largely of peace, it's clear a conflict is brewing as Jedi throughout the galaxy prepare to face mysterious threats from all around. The show will be set 100 years prior to the events of the Star Wars prequel trilogy, um, a time which is known as the High Republic. The era of the High Republic has been documented extensively with a lot of books, and the era is currently the focus of a publishing initiative which goes by Star Wars The High Republic. Now, I know there are question marks about how good the actual books uh, focused on the High Republic actually are. I know there are some criticisms there. Not the biggest, lots of people, not the biggest fan of the High Republic. I ha- sorry, I- I'm looking back. Just a second. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> all right. So, let's get into the trailer. So, first of all, I have to say that, damn, we have a really, really stacked cast here. Uh, I think the cast for, for the Acolytes is amazing. Li Lung, Li Lung Jay, of course. Um, looking forward to seeing more of him. After seeing him um, in so many Korean shows, uh, Carrie Ann Moss, love uh, it. I don't have uh, the the Squid Games guy. Of course, I have seen him in Squid Game. <laughs> I have a book of the Star Wars book. Okay, what what uh, what's that? Uh, from this is called Before the Storm, uh, book one of the Black Fleet Crisis. Do you know? I think after. Mm. Uh, 
New Republic. The remnants of the Empire now lie in complete disarray, and the emergence of the Jedi Knights has brought power and prestige to the fledgling government on Coruscant. Coruscant. Yesterday's rebels have become today's administrators and diplomats. So I think it's after the third. Um, okay. Okay. Um, uh, because it's, I think b in between. Wait. I don't know. So in between, in between the the original trilogy and uh, the new trilogy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, uh, first of all, Franco, as someone who has uh, skipped the last, I think, couple of shows, right? By Star Wars, you, you didn't watch Obi Wan. You watch? Did you watch season three of The Mandalorian? No, 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 no. You skipped no. it. <laughs> Would this be something you'd be interested in checking out? Um. C and no, so I'm uh, I'm uh, I I wish I wish they went back to the Andor. I'm sorry, uh, I'm a bit uh, I'm a bit of a Luddite because Andor Andor really made something particular. Who knows? Maybe they go through through the Andor thing, and there's and with the blood, maybe they're going to a bit more adult. Uh, they did say that it's going to be more adult, right? More mature. I mean, I hope it is because this is this is the, from the point of view of of uh, I don't know if it's from the point of view purely of the Sith because uh, I mean there is an issue there is an issue right with the whole Sith thing um, which we'll, I'll mention in a second which uh, Joe they, mentioned in chat they they retconned uh, it right so apparently it is it's so awkward now I'm sure there are ways you can get out of it right. There are ways you can get out of it. Now, to just in case some viewers and listeners don't know what we're talking about. Now, obviously, in The Phantom Menace, there is a comment during one of the scenes of the Jedi Council where someone says that a Sith has not appeared for a thousand years. And in this trailer, we have a scene in where we see a red lightsaber. A red lightsaber obviously means Sith, right? Now, there, there we go. Right now, this could be many things you could write yourself out of this issue in a million different ways right you can kill all the people who see the red lightsaber we know that the that the jedi council is not the most down to earth <laughs> uh, group of people so that is also a thing right um but franco i'm just looking it up now and i'm seeing on twitter that right now the acolyte has surpassed 500 thousand dislikes 500,000 dislikes with 177,000 likes. Why? Like, people are really taking this to heart. Now, there are numerous issues. On the one side, you have the con the, this whole idea of the Sith, who obviously you are breaking continuity from Phantom Menace. That's a group of people, and that's fine. If that's why you dislike this, that's fine. I'm seeing a lot of people upset that there is a lot of diversity in a galaxy far, far away. Oh. <laughs> there is a lot of diversity. Do you know, Franco? Yeah, no, no, I mean, of yeah, of diversity. course. I mean, all those aliens and, uh, you know, there's lots of diversity. In a... It's a fucking alien galaxy. <laughs> I don't get it. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Il Cristales. Esa, Franco, some good news. Listen, if you have Greg Frazier taking care of the cinematography of your show or movie, go ahead and use the volume. But if you don't have the amazingly talented Greg Frazier, don't or use at the least volume. someone who is as good as <laughs> Greg Frazier, which is, you know, one-offs, right? I'm sorry, but don't use the volume. Shoot on, se on set. And thankfully, it seems that the volume has not been used in the show. Still, I, 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 I don't know how believable that is, because looking at this scene, Franco, this screams the volume for me. Mm. This screams the volume. So I don't know how true that is. Wait, whether... is that the is that the crew? No, 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 no. That's the camp. That's the camp. That's the camp. Mm. <laughs> uh, it looked it, it look <laughs> like it looked <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> because looking at the scene, the scene was like, oh, man, that's CGI, right? That's CGI. I don't know. I don't know. There is a lack of depth to the whole scene. But anyways, 
Um, some other stuff that worries me, Franco. 30 minutes episode. 30 minute episodes. I'm sorry, but hi, Disney Plus haven't learned the le their lesson. 30 minute episodes are good if it's a comedy. If it's something mm. like The Bear with boom, quick, quick, quick episodes. But if you have something like Star Wars, you need to develop. And I'm sorry. Issa, the good thing about this is that the uh, the creator who did, uh, we said she did um, Russian Doll. Uh, in Russian Doll, Leslie Headland's episodes were also 30 minutes long. So maybe we have someone talented enough to create effective, well done 30 minute episodes. Maybe that's what she's comfortable with because after all, mm. even Russian Doll had 30 minute episodes. So that could be a good thing. But from what we've seen from Disney Plus so far, the 30 minute episodes were a mess. Like they could literally could just join them all together and form a movie. There was no reason for it to be a show in the first place. Mm. Hopefully Leslie Headland does a much better job here. Uh, overall, Franco, I'm interested. I think this is something different that we needed from Star Wars. Not very different, but even some of the action. There are some nice like kung fu elements here and there. Um, it's good to see Carrie Ann Moss, Jedi Fu, <laughs> Jedi Fu, being involved in the action, like the scene, for example. I hope the whole mystery, who like that that scene was fine. I, I like the scene, mm -hmm. the direction, well, well directed, well done. Um, I hope. Uh, this whole mystery murder mystery who's murdering the Jedi is done well I hope it's written well I hope there is mis um, the good elements of mystery in it I hope there's good elements of a who maybe a possibly who done it right to it um, mm. I think this is this is uh, good so far visually nothing impressive nothing out of this world the sets look fine the, the, I, mean, I mean Star Wars right they got a massive budget oh, Allah Harris it doesn't look good it's good that they're shooting on location. You can tell most of this is done on location, which is mm. good, well, right? Um, you know, lightsabers, force. We'll see, right? There, Anything else you want to add, Franco? There is also Abigail Thorne, the YouTuber of Philosophy Now, participating in this one. Okay. So that I'm looking forward for her role as well. I really nice. like. I, it's, it's, she's one of my favorite YouTubers. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm also noticing it's not the diversity that's that's bothering me. The the, the African American Jedi has has the African American hairdo. So and I saw an African American uh, essayist mentioning that apparently they're going for this hairdo for all the <laughs> black characters. It's kind of. Uh. By the way, I I want to see what what the fuss is all about because apparently. Um, there's this uh, movie. Um, uh, it was meant to be a satire, but apparently it's misfired big time. Huh? Uh, magical, the magical society of uh, no, the society of uh, what is it? The society, bear with me a second. So, the society, uh, the American society of. Magical Negro. Oh, yes, I've heard of that. Um, never released the monster. So, obviously, the magical, what was that? The magical society? The American Society of oh, Magical the Negroes. The American Society of Magical Negroes. Apparently, it's misfired big time, right, Franco? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be a satire, but apparently, it, it plays too much into the. Into the into, into the tropes, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I, th mm -hmm. I think this this would have been a good movie um, under uh, Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I haven't watched it. I have no idea about it, so I can't really comment. Can't really comment about it. All I've heard are the negative reviews, though. It's got like thirty percent on Rotten Tomatoes, so not a good sign. And mm -hmm. box office wise, absolute disaster. <laughs> That's all I know about it. Mena. Final trailer from Com. Yep. Is That's... basically the show I am most excited about, right? Um, season one of this show was amazing. It was my favorite series of, I believe that was 2021 or 2022. I'm not sure. Uh, 2021 or 2022, whenever it released. And here, obviously, I am talking about 
one of the best shows of the past few years, something Joe will definitely disagree with me on, House of the <laughs> Dragon. Because we've got season two of House of the Dragon coming up in June and a new trailer for the eagerly anticipated second season of HBO's House of the Dragon has just dropped. And while there's plenty of, this was interesting, sportsmanship on the field at the Super Bowl this evening, it doesn't seem to be the same in Westeros <laughs> as the collapse of the Targaryen family is continuing in dramatic fashion. Take it away, Andrea. I I, do, I don't touch this any. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Series, not even watched Game of Thrones. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because now I'm watching something by the creators of the Game of Thrones. True. So. <laughs> Benny of and Vice. Mm. Series adapted from the book Fire and Blood by George R. R. Martin returns later this year. And Martin has teased that the opening two episodes were powerful, emotional, gut wrenching, and heart rending just as season one was. Key returning cast members, Emma Darcy as Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen, Matt Smith as Prince Daemon Targaryen, Olivia Cook as Queen Alice in Hightower, Rai Siffins as Otto Hightower, and many others. New additions, we've got Clinton Liberty as Adam of Hall, Jamie Kenna as Sir Alfred Broom, Kieran Bew as Hugh, Tom Bennett as Ulf, and others. We've got Cregan Stark appearing, Sir what Rickard, Rickard Thorn, uh, Alan of Hall, Alice Rivers, Sir Gwen Hightower, and many other characters. Fans of Game of Thrones and the book Fire and Blood will be familiar with. Um, so, obviously, talking about this trailer, we have to comment about the ending of Season 1. Now, if you haven't watched House of the Dragon Season 1, please skip two minutes, two minutes, just two minutes. Um, obviously, we know that Season 1 ended with the start of the dance of the dragons um, um we had the whole which is the whole conflict between dragon riders right with the death of rhaenyra's son luceris um attacked by prince aemon and his dragon vegar now that one big event right sets off the dance of the dragons which is basically this massive conflict between the targaryen family which is split up into two basically um, on one side you have the blacks and on the other side you have the greens now in a genius marketing move the team behind house of the dragon released not one trailer but two <laughs> and this is really smart and really well done this is the black trailer right so this trailer is narrated and seen from the point of view of the blacks right uh, meaning from the point of view of Rhaenyra um, and her side, right? Who are on Dragonstone, at, 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 as you can see, um, on, at the start of season two. And they are preparing to take on the Greens. Now, the Greens also have their own trailer. Green mm -hmm. trailer. Also have their trailer, which is the Green trailer, uh, which shows the same events. But this time, from the point of view of the Greens, meaning Alison Hightower and her son, who is now obviously the king, right? Uh, that's Aegon II. Um, and I just think whoever came up with this idea of releasing these two trailers should receive, should receive a bonus, basically, because this is really smart marketing. It really pushes forward the idea of, are you team black or team green? Uh, who are you? Who are you? A stand for? Like I, I love, I love everything about this marketing. I'm Team Edwards. Very smart. I'm Team <laughs> Edwards. There. <laughs> uh, I think this is really smart. Now, talking obviously about the trailers themselves, I think the trailers give us a hint as to the whole epic scope of season two. I am very much looking forward to more political intrigue and machinations, more epic battles between dragons. The ending of season one had an insanely beautifully shot scene involving two dragons, and we're going to get so much more dragon action in season two. But as always, it's set in the world of Game of Thrones, set in Westeros, so we know that it's not just going to be massive battles and dragons. Hopefully, we still get the usual, you know, character drama. The, the, which is, as always, very well written, apart from season eight and season seven. Um, we get lots of character moments as well. 
epic scenes like these. So uh, I'm looking forward to this. I think the Dragon CGI has continued improving. Looking at this scene, for me, this looks amazing. The only issue with the dragons usually is the floating part, right? Because you've got mm. someone standing on the dragon and it feels like they're floating and not on an actual dragon, which which sometimes is an issue, right? Um, with 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 having someone appearing on a dragon. Uh, well, hopefully, hopefully it looks better in season two. I think this looks great. I think the sets look great. I think the the visuals look great. I'm all for it. I'm all in. I am team black. I am definitely team black. I am team Rhaenyra. I am <laughs> definitely a Rhaenyra stan. And I am so excited to watch this. Franco, I don't think you have any thoughts about this, right? No, not at all. We can move on. Moving swiftly on. <laughs> moving swiftly on. Franco, I don't know if you've heard about this controversy. I just wanted to mention it really quickly because I have another bit of a rant today. Which I'm going Again? To to yes. Again? Is it about gaming, per chance? Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> what, no. Not no, but I have to agree with you about the, uh, the next. Okay, so this one, yeah. So, Dragon's Dogma. Now, to start off, to be clear, I played a lot of the first Dragon's Dogma. I think the first Dragon's Dogma, whilst being having lots of issues, whether it's with the diversity of the world, whether how, how repetitive some of the action starts to become, some design decisions I disagree with. Visually, it's quite bland, but overall, I think it's it's a good game. It's a good RPG. I mentioned Dragon's Dogma 2 as one of the games I was most excited to play um, uh, this, yep. this, this year. Unfortunately, for now, I refuse to purchase it for a number of reasons, um, basically two. To be clear, um, microtransaction, I play, I play a lot of Call of Duty, right? And the first claim will be, wait, you're not, you, you play Call of Duty, but you refuse to buy Dragon's Dogma 2, and Call of Duty is chock a block full of microtransactions. It's a different story. Call of Duty is a multiplayer game. It has a whole game mode, which is free, which is Warzone. There you have develop developers consist constantly working and creating new maps, new gameplay elements, new guns, new everything, right? Um, so clearly they need a way to monetize it. It's impossible to have a whole game mode like Warzone played by, I would say, hundreds of thousands of people keep the servers up without adding some element of monetization to it. There, I understand completely why microtransactions exist, just as I agree with how they exist in Helldivers 2, just as I agree with how they exist in uh, Last Epoch, for example, Last, like they exist in Path of Exile, where you have a whole game for free. I agree with micro. I, I mean, I don't love them. I don't think I'm not, not cheering the fact that there are microtransactions, but they have to make money somehow, right? They have to make money somehow. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a necessary evil. Let's call it that. It's a necessary evil. But Dragon's Dogma 2 is a single-player game. And Dragon's Dogma 2 doesn't cost 30 euros, last, like, like Last Epoch and Helldivers 2. It's not free like Warzone and Part of Exile. It's 70 euros. So for me, the <laughs> fact that a, a AAA 70 euro game, as good as, as good as it is, has 21 separate microtransactions available day one raging in price from 99 cents to five dollars including an explorer's camping kit which weighs less than camping kits you find in game <laughs> keys all right people will say you find lots of keys in the game but these you can get at the start making the game much easier isn't that pay to win Mm. Port crystal warps. All right, you find many port crystal warps and you find many wake stones later on as well. But don't you think wake stones help you at the start of the game? You find them later on in the game, right? Because I've seen people saying, yes, but you can find them. I played 100 hours of this game and you find a lot. 100 hours, all right. But not many people play 100 hours of a game in a week. So wouldn't someone be inclined to buy a wake stone to make sure that when they die, they can be restored back to life? If they play what five six hours of this game for me it is a disgrace for me it is an absolute disgrace 
And obviously this whole microtransaction thing has created lots and lots of controversy. Now that's reason one why I've decided not to buy this game. Now, what makes it even worse, considering that you've got these uh, port crystal warps, which are location markers, which help, which can, which you can fast travel with, is are the comments by the game developer. Now, to be clear, I don't think I don't blame this on the game developer, right? I blame this on the suits at Capcom because Capcom is a piece of shit company. But the game developer told IGN, just give it a try. Travel is boring. That's not true. It's only an issue because your game is boring. All you have to do is make travel fun. That's why you place things in the right location for players to discover or come up with enemy appearance methods that create different experiences each time or force players into blind situations where they don't know whether it's safe or not 10 meters in front of them. So you've got the developer commenting about how much work they've put in, you know, developing this, this world, designing a map done specifically for traveling to avoid fast traveling. But then you have a microtransaction selling items which can be used to fast travel now what do i do here do i call bullshit on the developer or do i say the developer didn't know about the microtransactions i don't know and the fact that this doubt is in my head shouldn't exist right because if you've got this developer who cares so much about developing a world where you travel on foot. And then you've got that same game, having microtransactions, selling fast an item that helps you to fast travel, then what the fuck? Like, what's going on here, right? So this is very upsetting. I, for now, I refuse to buy it. <laughs> Dragon's Dogma more like drags on my wallet. <laughs> um, this guy refunded it. I'm happy he did. Um, of course, lots of people are upset about this. The game looks amazing, but we have massive, still, still issues with the PC build of the game, where you've got massive, massive performance issues on Dragon's Dogma 2, which unfortunately leading to frame rate issues, for example. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't be bothered to once more play a game where the frame rate is horrid, I can't deal with this shit. I'm 30, I'm going to play games that work. Rant over, let us know in the comment section below your thoughts about this whole issue with microtransactions in a single player game. I'd love, love, love to hear our viewers and listeners thoughts about this. Franco, I don't know if you want to comment about, about this whole issue with regard to the microtransactions. Uh -oh. I mean, uh, same consistent message. This is all, uh, it's, it all seems to me like a scam. Uh, it's, it's, we've, we've, uh, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been an issue with other games as well. Like, uh, and apparently companies and suits don't want, don't want to learn from their mistakes. Don't want to learn from Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate. Like, for example, I heard Larry and are not, are not going to, uh, to do any other more uh, Baldur's Gates as well. Yes, unfortunately, that uh, just came out recently. From what I read, Franco, um, mm. the developers at, at Larian Studios, they had uh, they had uh, started working on uh, on the DLC for Baldur's Gate Three, but mm. the team just couldn't couldn't uh, couldn't find kind of like the passion for it, right? Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately, they, they stopped and, and they decided as a whole team that, listen, we're going to stop working on, on Dungeons and Dragons and we're going to move on to something else. Um, yeah. And I respect it. Which I respect is, which... the fact that they're not, you know, milking it. Exactly. I mean, there's the I game. Mean, They've invested the... years, right? Go ahead, Franco. Sorry. No, no, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a very smart move, I would say. I mean, how long can you... I mean, it's now it's flogging a dead horse. Oh, they they would say it. Indeed, indeed, indeed. All right, and with that, Franco, I think we can move on to our reviews because we've got quite a few reviews to talk about today. Yep, yep. Um, how about Franco? You start off with stop motion. I'm interested to hear our thoughts about this one because, I, like I told you, Franco, I've been seeing some uh, I've been seeing some reviews about it from. 
um, the people over at Red Letter Media who said it's a very, very, very good film. Unfortunately, I didn't find the time to watch it, but thankfully you did, Franco. Okay. So let's start off our review section with Franco's review for stop oh, motion. And I'm motion. not shocked to see that its rating on IMDb is very low. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen. Um, so first of all, we start with the storyline. The stop motion is about a stop motion, <laughs> surprise, surprise, animator <laughs> struggling to control her demons, her demons after the loss of her overbearing mother. Now, um, uh, from the get go, you, you either like this movie or you hate it. Um, I've seen comments where people called it pretentious and I've seen comments as well, like Andrea said, where they really, really like uh, enjoy it. Now, if uh, another con that I, of this movie is it does suffer a bit from pacing issues, despite the running time of one hour thirty six minutes. Is it one hour thirty six minutes? Uh, room... Oh, where's the time? Up, oh, up. Yeah. One, hour, yeah, one, hour, one hour thirty three minutes. Um, that being said, I haven't seen such a movie in a long time. Weird, unsettling, sound design, amazing. Um, uh, there are lots of practical effects. Um, go there's gore in it as well. I, uh, I, w <laughs> I, w I watched this in the morning, but I, so, but I was drinking coffee and did it didn't help with the dread <laughs> because I was feeling mm. it jacked up. Um, earlier on, before we started the, the podcast, I told Andrea that this is what uh, Peter Strickland. Ari Aster and Jaskov Meyer had a threesome, and this is their unholy child. I don't know how you can have a threesome, have a child, but this stop motion would be it. Um, uh, but you've been warned. I mean, this is uh, you either like it, you either like it or hate it. I feel that this is a movie, you know, like move, a movie made for Bruce. I'm not joking because uh, it has that weirdness. There are some oh, there are some humorous moments as well, um, I, and either you stick with it because it's it it almost feels like there's no direction that it's too weird, so it it or and, and so it it how shall I say it it goes on its own terms, mm -hmm. or or you or you or you like shut up because like I said some people said some people went into it but uh, again sound design was great like uh, I the the idea there was a moment where you you hear humans work walking and you and you hear their joints <laughs> as well like mm. like armature joints of the stop motion puppets it was uh, for I don't know. <laughs> I cannot say I enjoyed it, but it was a very interesting watch. I gave it a 3.5 on 5. Okay. That's 3.5. Yeah, it's a 3.5 on 5. I understand it. Well, I understand the rating though. Like I said, it's a, it's a love it or hate it movie. You said that Leather Media absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um I do I do agree that it's uh, it we it, these movies are rare to come by recently because it's a very unique vision. The stop motion looks fantastic. There's really good stop motion. The practicals are good, and uh, the the last twenty minutes are just bonkers. <laughs> mm. These are Jay. Jay. His name is Jay. He's he's one of the one of the YouTubers on Red Letter Media. He said, "Movie good." <laughs> <laughs> I said on on uh, on my letterbox D. I said, "What in the SCP creepy pasta did I just watch?" <laughs> Listen to this, Franco. That's how the infinite dude on Twitter said, I watched a short film by the same director and the feeling was uncomfortable and aggressive. I feel a nervous anticipation about sitting through that for a feature length duration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then no, that... Stefan Lapin said, I'll check it out, but I heard it was slow and boring. Hmm. Um, uh, look, I don't think it was... They, like, I've only felt I've only felt that that dragging pace like in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, I, I did I did feel I did feel it it was slowing down in the middle. Like for example, the second deck was quite slow, but then it picks up again at the end. 
Um, Lalo, did you know, Franco, there's going to be a Dead Stalker remake? Stalker. Dead Stalker. Dead Stalker. The nine. Uh, it's a 1983 movie. That. This one. It just popped up on my Twitter now. There's going to be a Dead Stalker What's remake. This? It's. La, it's... La. <laughs> this, this looks very heavy metal. <laughs> it's. Uh, how do you describe this? It's like very practical effects, like monsterish i don't know how to describe it but it, it's, I don't know, it's like very very 80s a, b imagine an 80 fantasy b movie exactly b movie b movie yeah but it's got interesting it's got like some creativity behind it i i know i mean no, for it's sure, not for a good sure. movie yeah, it's not, not <laughs> Well, it's interesting they decided to go for a remake of this stuff. By, by the way, speaking of 80s, uh, and then we'll go back to the reviews. I plan to watch Black Eagle. The Jean -Claude I haven't Van... watched that. The Jean-Claude Van Damme movie that was filmed in Malta. <laughs> I haven't watched this. I haven't watched this. I watched a lot of uh, Van Damme. But <laughs> I but look, look at the ratings. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Oh, my God. Arrasta. <laughs> Recognize Malta at once. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, funny, funny enough, I I think we've we've had uh, we've had the reputation since ages, you know, because uh, <laughs> it's we are uh, we are a terrorist nation, apparently. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else you want to add about stop motion, Franco? Um, no. Once again, uh, if you want something unique, unsettling, um, bizarre, check it out. Um, uh, but you've been warned this is a love it or hate it kind of movie <laughs> alright so that is Franco's review for stop motion let me give my review for Roadhouse on a Franco next <laughs> Roadhouse next Roadhouse <laughs> um, so Roadhouse starring Jake Gyllenhaal and the notorious Conor McGregor um, it's a film it's a film. <laughs> it, it's a movie. Um, obviously, it's a remake of the 1989 film um, starring Patrick Swayze. Was great in that role. Um, this one stars, like I said, Jake Gyllenhaal, Conor McGregor. We've got Daniela Melchior. Uh, this is actually McGregor's first film. I'm surprised he hadn't appeared in the film before. Um, basically, the plot here is extremely complex and really like just like three body problem, right? Super complex. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Uh, of course, this is right. It's, we've got this uh, UFC fighter, Elwood Dalton. Um, he, he, right, all, what, all he does um, is basically makes a living of scamming fighters um, in like, these underground fights. Right, When people recognize it's him, they just give up and say, go ahead and take the money. Um, uh, he's approached by Frankie, who is the owner of a roadhouse. Roadhouse is in one word. We know that obviously Roadhouse here is two words. Um, uh, who's the owner of a Roadhouse where they've been getting issues with uh, with people coming in and breaking stuff. Uh, Dalton eventually accepts the offer and goes there as a bouncer. And so we see Dalton's kind of like adventures there in Florida um, where he becomes friends with, with, some, with people in, in, in Florida and so on. Anyways. Long story short, um, I haven't, I, I, I'm not sure if I watched the original or not. I'm, I really don't know if I watched the original or not. It's, it's like I have a memory of the film, but I don't remember much. I just remember scenes here and there. I feel like I, I might have watched it. Maybe my parents were watching it and, and I just fell asleep watching some <laughs> scenes here and there. But I have some memories of the film. But uh, but I don't have like a full recollection of how the first one was, right? But this version of Roadhouse, I honestly had a blast watching it. I think it's a very good film. It's a very, no, sorry. It's a very fun film, not a very good film. It is not a very good film. It is a very fun film, though. Um, I was surprised to see Mario Vella saying that he didn't like Gillian Hall in this. I thought he was very charismatic. I thought he was super charismatic in this um and as bad as conor mcgregor was and he is objectively awful in this he hands it up horribly <laughs> it was just something it was just something which was making me smile even with conor mcgregor's awful performance there was just something really fun about all this um, and i think 
eventually the dynamic between Gillen Hall and, and uh, McGregor actually really worked for me. I'm surprised I'm saying this because I should be saying I hated it, but there was just something fun about this film that just just worked here for me. Um, and uh, like I've insinuated, I could tear this movie apart. I could eviscerate it with criticism. The CGI, it's horrific. The pacing, <laughs> terrible pacing. Midway through, the movie just sags so heavily. It's two hours. A movie like this should never be two hours. There should be a, a law where a movie like Roadhouse should be one hour, 30 minutes. Punto basta. Some of the performances here are shocking. Like the nurse, Daniela Melchior. Like, I don't know what she's been in, but she is impressively bad. Like, I cannot explain how bad she, she was in this, right? What an introduction for my Greg, eh? <laughs> Keith said. And by the way, by the way, Bruce said he'll definitely check out stop motion. Hmm, I think that sounds like <laughs> the kind of movie Bruce would <laughs> enjoy. There's Post Malone as well. <laughs> yes, Post Malone is a fighter. He's the first fighter we see. And, and I, we started the film. And I turned to Tracy and I'm like, wait, that's that's Post Malone. He's like, no, he's not that fat. I was like, but no, that's Post Malone. That's his face. And I am supposed to believe that Post Malone is this like really tough fighter. Like knowing <laughs> knowing Post Malone, I love his music, but he's anything but like a tough, you know, MMA fighter. Uh, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's just uh, just one scene. Um, this is Conor McGregor right in the film. Listen, physically, <laughs> physique wise, and like his appearance, he's there, right? Action wise, he's great. <laughs> but they, uh, they could have gone with Tom Hardy, though. Eh? Yes, yeah, so I think I think I understand why they went with Conor McGregor because it's MMA. You think? This is not a movie taking itself seriously. Okay. Is, and and not really a spoiler, but there are like a mid. There's a mid credit scene. Which is like, uh, uh, which really made me laugh, by the way, because there are lots of moments in this film where I was laughing. Sometimes I was laughing with the film, sometimes I was laughing at the film. At the film. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is a scene at the end which confirmed that all those times I was laughing at the film, those scenes were actually on purpose, were actually ridiculous on purpose, because the final scene, midway through the credits, is so ridiculous that it was like, listen, I hope to make it obvious for you in case it wasn't obvious. This is not a film you are supposed to take seriously. But wow. just to be certain, let me show you this scene to make it 100% clear <laughs> that you are never supposed to take any of this seriously. Seriously. It's it's hilarious. I I I had a really good time. And thinking about all the bad films I've seen this year because 2024 has had some bad films. This is actually one of my favorite films so far of the year. Sad to say. <laughs> Said to say, <laughs> with all the horrible performances, with the awful CGI, with the severe overacting and and hamming up by Conor McGregor, this was actually a really fun time, a really really fun time. You you need this, you need this. <laughs> Sometimes you do need. This. And the final third of the film was actually had some pretty impressive stunts and props to friend of the show Eric Linden. Who took care of the stunts on this film, and it really shows. I mean, obviously, having Conor McGregor, you know, helps, right? That really helps. But the stunts in this are insane, are really impressive. The fight scenes are well done, well choreographed. Again, Gillen Hall and McGregor, match made in heaven for that, right? So the stunts are fantastic, the fight sequences are great, the standoff between McGregor and Gillen Hall. Where everything I wanted out of a film named Roadhouse, <laughs> I I don't get the criticism for it. I I had a very good time. I had a very very good time. It is, I would say, an objectively bad movie. But thinking about how much fun I had, I can't give this less than a three or a three point five. I'd say a three. It's just a fun movie. It's a really fun film. And if so, you want to shut up so your brain. Yeah, Franco. So bad it's good, basically. Um, but in a very self-aware way. Uh, right? Okay, okay. It's that... very, very self-aware about it. Like I've said, 
the film knows what it's doing. Doug Ryman, he's done tons of movies. He knows what film he's making here, right? He knows what... oh, so good. That's another one of the best action movies released in the past few years. Um, he knows what he did. Fair game. Uh, yeah. He was a producer. Yeah, producer, producer. Right. producer. Um, he, right, Doug Lyman knows what he's doing here. So this film is incredibly self-aware. So the fact that this film is incredibly self-aware for me makes it so much more fun. It's not taking itself seriously here. And no one should try to take this film seriously because the <laughs> film is telling you, don't take me seriously. Just come for the ride. Have a fun time. Watch Gyllenhaal and McGregor beat up each other. Laugh with us and end the film and leave without having any thoughts about it. No need to use your brain here. And I was all in for it. And that's why I think I had such a good time with this film. Three out of five for me for Roadhouse. Check it out if you want to, you know, shut off your brain and have a good time watching an action film. Moving on, Franco, to Quiet. On set, oh. is, I think the opposite of Roadhouse. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You watched, you watched, you watched I it. I have not. I have not. Uh, thank God it's four episodes. Apparently, there's a fifth coming as well. I don't know. It seems to have it needs to wrap it up. Quiet on set. This was an explosive documentary. It's basically a docu series that uncovers the toxic culture behind some of the most iconic children's show of the late 1990s and early 2000s, mostly on Nickelodeon. Um, Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon. If you remember, Drake and oh, Josh, I Carly. Josh. Dude, what, if, if you, when you, when you get to know what Drake Bell went through to like to be able to do this, this show, you'd be, you'd be heartbroken. Not not that he didn't do anything wrong as well, but uh, you under you have a bit more understanding of the hell that he went through, and the it, it's it's some it's a, it's a story that repeats itself. However, somehow you, you know um, uh, we've heard it all before. Toxic white culture, um, uh, this idea of the torture genius. There was a line I I particularly liked by. Scotty, uh, let me check her name because uh, she was one of the persons interviewed. Bear with me a second because I'm going on to my letterbox. Oh, I just realized that I also saw the holdovers. Anyway, but back to this. Um, uh, yeah, Scotty Cool said that like we should stop like. Uh, lionizing torture geniuses the, because much of the focus on of this documentary is dan schneider uh, the mind behind many of the iconic series drake and josh iCarly. um uh, the documentary doesn't invent the wheel as far as docu series goes but it's an important watch because uh like you'd say, uh, I'm not gonna put my kids uh, through this, even if they <laughs> like uh, acting. But uh, uh, sometimes, some it, it's almost made me say, you know, maybe Sound of Freedom was onto something. And uh, it's it's it, I, I cannot I cannot words cannot explain how I felt. I felt disgust. I felt heartbroken. Uh, there were some moments where, like, don't like, has this gone on air seriously? Because there were so many adult jokes in it, like hidden adult jokes. But then knowing who was behind these adult jokes, you'd be like, oh my god, how did they get away with it? And there's a particular, there's a particular uh, character in this uh, in this uh, docu series that went on to work with disney i'm not going to spoil it for you but when you get to know the whole story you'd say how is it possible that he got to work with disney after after being caught doing what he was got doing jesus um i gave it a five out of five because it's important that people know about this um uh, 
and again, yes, hopefully, hopefully we'll dispel the myth of torture genius, especially after we had another we had another apology video with him and another and another actor that worked mm -hmm. with him, mm -hmm. and and yeah, it's like oh, you know what was missing from the apology video? <laughs> the ukulele. <laughs> I remember that ukulele. Oh. Uh, guys, check it out. Um, uh, Again, it's uh, it's good to know about certain stuff going on. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's quite on set. The dark side of kids TV. Oh, can't wait to ruin my mem childhood memories watching this docu series. I'll watch it during the holidays. I'll have some time to watch it then. Um, shall I move on to three body problem, Franco, and then I'll let's go. With Ghostbusters. So three body problem, Franco. You watch a couple of episodes, right? Uh, three episodes. I want to hear what you, I want to hear what you think about it so far. Oh, let's start off. It's a science fiction television series created by the famous or infamous now hmm, <laughs> famous infamous uh, Game of Thrones creators David Benioff, DB Vice, and they are joined by Alexander Wu. It's uh, based on the Chinese novel, or based on the first and the second Chinese novel, I believe, because there's a it's a trilogy, and it's uh, apparently the series adapts the first book and goes into half of the second book. The novel, The Three Body Problem, by Liu Qixin. I don't know how to pronounce that. C i x i n Qixin. It's obviously the second live action adaptation of this. There is a Chinese television series, which is apparently also quite good. And, there, and sticks closer to the source material than this. Um, now, in this show, we've got, uh, we start off, well, I'm going to just go through quickly through the story, and we start off with a very, very shocking opening scene um, set during, obviously, the Cultural Revolution by Mao Zedong, and in which we see this professor, right, of physics, by the way. Hello, hello, Yella. Hey, hey. Uh, we're just talking about a tree body problem right now which both me and Franco have started. And I'm just commenting about the opening, which was, for me, incredibly shocking, um, seeing this professor of physics, who obviously has uh, clearly fallen foul of the uh, cultural revolutionaries, uh, because he's teaching uh, Western science, basically. Um, I mean, science, right? It's not Western. Yeah, but, science. So I mean, <laughs> obviously, coming from a Western perspective back then. Uh, and we see him beaten to death as his wife denounces him and as his daughter, Ye Winje, who becomes one of the main characters in the story, watches the goings on. Now, this shocking event and obviously many other shocking things that happen to Ye Winje as she is tortured, as she is treated horribly, uh, lead to then the actions taken by Ye Winje later on in the show which I won't spoil, but which are kind of like the catalyst of the whole goings on in the present. Because here we have two storylines, right? We have the storyline set during the Cultural Revolution. And then we have the present day where we start to see, kind of like, I, I, I'm, I don't really get physics, right? I was never a science guy. But mm -hmm. it's, you've got like physical laws being broken. You've got all these different scientists who are, who are uh, you know, committing s i don't say the word because yeah, YouTube yeah. will block us but committing... An unaliving themselves yeah in a video game um and all these all these goings on are investigated by um this ex-cop who is obviously benedict wong and uh, dashi great to see benedict Clarence wong, dashi. Yeah. Uh, in a different role um now obviously then we start to follow these different scientists, right? We've got these different scientists. We've got Saul, we've got Oggy, um, we've got uh, who has Jin, we've got Will, and we've got Jack. Jack, who is my personal favorite. I love Jack. <laughs> Hot take. Uh, I, I, it, it was he was grating me a bit, uh, but uh, really, I, I love Jack. I really I, like Jack. <laughs> uh, no, no, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. I chuckled to some of his, li his lines. Uh, don't get me wrong, but uh, again, me coming from from reading the book, he was not a character at all in it. That's why. All I'm right, saying. all right, all right. But uh, but no, I, like you said, like for people who are come in, uh, um, uh, no, keep finish first, and then I'll, I'll butt in. All later. right. 
So, um, um, and big, one of the big uh, plot elements at the start of this show is obviously we see Oggy, who gets, I don't know how to describe it, whether it's a hallucination, whatever, of this countdown, right? And apparently, if that countdown reaches zero, she dies, right? Now, how she dies, apparently, I would assume that it's, you know, offing herself in a certain way, right? And also, we've got other interesting elements, interesting sci-fi elements. For example, people who meet our protagonists, but never appearing on CCTV. And my favorite element of this, actually, no, my second favorite element of the show, which is the virtual reality game, which is, I think, an impressive thing, really impressively done. And to get into my thoughts about it now, uh, I think visually there is some really impressive stuff in this show. Watching it on my on my LG television, this is the kind of stuff I'm like, wow, you know what this was literally look good on? It would really look good in the cinema. This is the kind <laughs> of show I like. You know, sometimes shows should be watched in the cinema because there are some scenes where I was really impressed. Like visually, it's really impressive stuff. Um, and overall, it's a visually impressive series. I think it's well shot. I think it's well well directed, and it's well great visuals. Um, now, uh, I think we need more of these kinds of you know high concept uh, sci-fi shows. And I'm really happy that Netflix took the plunge with this. I'm scared that the algorithm will work against your body problem and we won't get a second season. Mm. I hope a lot of people are watching it because I think we want more of these kinds of high concept shows. There are some negatives though. I'm enjoying myself watching it so far, but there are some negatives. First of all, unfortunately, some characters are, like you said, Franco, I'm going to use your word, grating, right? My personal most annoying character is Augie. Isa Gonzalez. Now, I unfortunately am a little biased against her. <laughs> the last thing I saw her in was Ambulance. Uh... Also, I did Jake Gyllenhaal film, uh, which I liked. Don't get me wrong, I liked Ambulance. It's a Michael Bay film, of course. The film where Michael Bay discovered... FPV. <laughs> oh, so, so it was a fun watch at the cinema. Don't get me wrong. Um, but Isaac Gonzalez in this was whew, really bad. Uh, so I'm a little biased against her. I don't think she's a very good actress from what I've seen so far. And her character in this is whew, really annoying. Really, really annoying. I mean, there are moments where she's like, wait, you're with someone else, but, they're, but you're not together, right? So what, what's she doing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, this guy is simping for her 24-7. <laughs> and the one moment he's alone, she calls him and she's like, you're with someone else? What? Huh? No, he's she... not. Wait, he wasn't alone. Eh? <laughs> no, no, no. Of course he wasn't alone. But he has every right not to be alone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, they're not together. They're clearly not together. She treats him horribly at times. She, 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 she... Like, I, I don't get what's going on with Orgy. And the fact that the actress is an actress I don't, I'm not really a big fan of. You know, that's the issue. <laughs> that's <what you're> <laughs> so I so unfortunately it is true, Franco. I agree with you. Some of the characters are annoying. I personally really like Jack. I thought he was the most thrill of them all. At one point, he's like, I wouldn't kill myself. My life's amazing. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, your life is amazing. <laughs> no, no shit. <laughs> but you're not seeing numbers uh, whenever <laughs> you close your eyes. <laughs> uh and, and I, I found that funny. I found that very funny. Um I thought the best part of the show personally were all the scenes set in the Cultural Revolution, right, in China. I think those scenes were amazing, harrowing at times, seeing her, her imprisonment and, and seeing Yia Winche and her scientific activity really adds more context and more understanding as to why she takes the decision she takes. I don't know if it's at the end of episode three or episode, episode four where she does Episode um, three? Episode two. Two, where she takes the big decision to press a certain button and do a certain thing. That, but, that really adds that a was, lot of context to that. That was goosebump inducing. Yeah, I was like, yeah, uh... That was impressive, really impressive. And um, up to the point where I've reached, I'm spoilers, it's bro. Really spoilers, bro. I want determination. No 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 no. no, 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 no spoilers, no spoilers. It's really intriguing stuff. It's it's well done. It's well done drama. Some of the dialogue sometimes feels a little off. Sometimes I feel like these should be scientists, but they sound like just like random teenagers mm -hmm. uh, in euphoria. 
Uh, but I mean, they, they, they try to. Like, it's like it's like they're trying to make scientists cool, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but and here's another thing, Apera. I mean, uh, having read the source material, they transposed they transposed most of the Chinese characters to London. So I think I think there's uh, there's some extra characters for sure. Like uh, I think they split one character into three. It seems okay. Oggy, uh, I forgot who else. Um, th like they, they have not, they, like they have nothing to do with, uh, with, with what I read in the book. Euphoria is a better series. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you know, you know, I wasn't really a fan of it. I, I visually it's great, but I felt it was very, I don't know, very exploitative. My I mean, comment, uh, termination. My comment about Euphoria is not like to put a conflict between the two. It's like, you know, in Euphoria, you've got lots of teenagers doing dumb teenager stuff. But here we're looking at, you know, supposedly PhD uh, genius scientists, <laughs> right? And the fact that they still act and talk like teenagers in Euphoria is what puts me off sometimes in this show. It's one of the few negatives, I would say. Um, yeah, visually, Euphoria is amazing. Visually, Euphoria is amazing. Mm, Go I'm, on. I'm, no, yeah, but they, they did say that what they did comment about this. Uh, I'm, well, first of all, I'm enjoying it so far. Like, um, I understand that this has to be, this series has to be uh, not palatable, like uh, widely available for, for a wider audience. So they went. For a Western to, audience, right? It's for a Western audience. For a Western audience. Um, uh, not to mention that there is the the Chinese did make a series of their own, like with all the Chinese characters, which I mm -hmm. would like to check after this. Mm -hmm. Visually, you're right, but there was a moment where the CG was really not good. Like there was the horse oh, when they when you see the computer when they started to float. Yes, um, uh, the horse is really bad when you see like the horse, like. Uh, you have to go to the, to the can and and it's like oh my god that looks really really bad and even certain moments i don't know maybe they did it on on purpose that they no, it do is a look... bit video gamey it is a bit video gamey at times yeah, yeah a video yeah. game right i think that's the whole point uh, maybe that's that's the whole point that's what i mean um uh, i don't know um uh, okay guys uh, this this scene this scene was quite uh, was quite uh amazing <laughs> yeah. yeah i was like whoa okay i think this is the moment where i where the series really caught me really grabbed me by the hand it, i think it was this scene that really did it and i was mm. like okay now i'm in now i'm in right now i'm in um uh, okay so guys th this was quite this was this also was quite uh, something as well the sigigi what what was it sigigi the virtual reality game, no? Probably. Yeah, but when when the so guys, spoilers ahead. So I'm just gonna say again because I know the how the story goes. This was when when the three sons aligned basically, like mm -hmm. ah, mm -hmm. Franco uh, Franco Termination said, "Imagine if VR was actually like this, what would you do?" I mean, if I, you know, for, so for example, at one point, Jack describes the feeling of spoilers. All right, for uh, for. Uh, episodes three, four, and so on. He describes the feeling of actually being killed. So he actually felt like the blade was slicing his yeah. throat. <laughs> I wouldn't want to play a game like that, the Turban Nation, to be honest with you. But it's intriguing. I love video games. I love video games. I'm not that intrigued so far by VR because the graphics and the gameplay feel a little gimmicky. But if VR was actually this realistic, and look this good, count me in. Huh? Count but, but, me in. I uh, would go for it. But look, uh, look on the bright side. There's no microtransactions. <laughs> True. There's True. There, there's a major transaction though <laughs> to be done since it's uh, since it's it has to do with uh, giving up. True. <laughs> so True. what it, you said? Which episode are you? I think I'm on episode five now. I've watched five. episode five, I believe. And what what is how how are uh, what is the proceeding right now? So uh, we know what happened with episode three, with uh, with on episode uh, three. What's the last thing that's happened? Um, 
Oh, they attacked. They, but but I don't want to tell you spoilers, Franco, because they attacked the sting a certain group of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they end up in hospital and so on. So, and how many? How many? I hope I hope it's just the first book because I haven't read. Apparently, the... it's a book and a half. First book and the half of the second book. Shit. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Which I've read. I said I have to watch the last few episodes, so obviously I don't know, and I haven't read the book, so I can't really comment about that. So I, I don't. I don't mind. Uh, I mean, if it if it's the beginning of the second book, it's fine. But I think, Franco, we can say that overall, I think Benioff Weiss and Alexander Wu have done a pretty good job uh, adapting this. I think it's gotten quite a lot of acclaim from many people. I think some critics mm. have been a little harsh with it. Obviously, I mean, obviously, if, if you're a critic, you're more no, you but don't like it. You don't like it, of course. Even even the even the audience was very was very harsh to to tell you the truth. Like I don't understand why. What what's the so on IMDb it has a seven point eight, which is quite good. But I think. but on Rotten Tomatoes is forty six or forty three percent. Forty six, really? Yeah, yeah, check, check, check. Uh, like I would has... be really shocked if it's if it's that low on Rotten Tomatoes. I think this is this is uh, this is a very watchable show. It does it does you know the high concept really well where you still have lots of high concept ideas here but it's a very watchable show it's still a very watchable show so no everybody problem it is 76 percent on on rotten tomatoes and the audience rating is no no they're both 76 percent actually they're both 76 percent really no wait yeah. hold on hold on hold on hold on hold on uh, mara franco 76 percent uh critics and 70 percent audience suddenly Okay, because um, which is good to see, which is good to see, because I think we need more of these high concept shows. Uh, it's great to see smart sci-fi. It's great to see, you know, but oh, yeah, okay. it's not. It's not too slow. I think the best thing they've done is that they've kept the smart concepts, but it's not too slow. Where you know your average average viewer will get bored watching it. I think your average viewer will still have a good time watching it. No, no, it's it's uh, the concepts are very well uh, are very well explained as well. So mm -hmm. uh, exactly, exactly. Where someone like me who is very stupid and not knowledgeable at all about <laughs> physics is not lost. So they and they did it. They didn't. So they didn't say how how they managed to break the laws of physics yet. I don't think they have, at least where I've reached so far. I don't think they have because in the in the book it was it's such a it's such a nifty trick that they did the. All right, like, so I'm very 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 much looking forward to that. Um, um, <laughs> um, no, but it's smart. Like yeah, when Je yeah when just character is such, I mean it's still it's it's also like the what happened with the book. It's afterwards afterwards. Afterwards, it dawned on me the, this kind of like impending, inescapable, impending doom. <laughs> Oof. All right. Anything else you want to add about your body problem, Rocco? No, I'm, I'm looking. Masters. I'm looking forward to to keep watching it and mm -hmm. uh, see where it takes me. Definitely, definitely. So to conclude the podcast, we will end the show with. The final review, obviously, it is our main topic of the day, and that is Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire. And I went in expecting to dislike it, because everything about this I should dislike. And I came out surprisingly okay, which is, I think, a word I will use a lot today. Okay, it's okay. Directed by Gil Kennan from a screenplay he co-wrote with Jason Reitman. It is a sequel, obviously, to Ghostbusters Afterlife, which I commented about at the start of the podcast. And in total, the fifth film, the fifth film now, in the Ghostbusters franchise. Paul Rudd, Gary Coon, Finn Wolfhard, uh, McKenna Grace, Celeste O'Connor, Logan Kim. We've got Bill Murray, obviously, Dan Aykroyd, Ernie Hudson, Annie Potts, William Matherson, all the old dudes there. Uh, there's a surprisingly very good Kamil Najiani in this. There is Patton Oswalt making an appearance as well. So lots of good, you know, actors in this, very good comedic actors in this. Kamil Najiani, especially, I'm going to comment about later on. He is, I think, very, very good in this, comedy-wise, of course. Now, this is set two years after Afterlife. Um, and in it, we see the veteran Ghostbusters who joined forces with the, you know, our younger Ghostbusters, our Paul Rudd and so on, 
or rather not that young anymore but obviously we've got Finn Wolfhard and and, and his friends um uh, who have to save the world in New York City from a debt chilling god who seeks to build a spectral army now I started my review on Letterbox saying that you know there's a lot to like here and that sometimes sometimes good old nostalgia from the 80s actually works i know blame it on stranger things but the past few years have yeah. been filled filled with remember the 80s we loved the 80s <laughs> oh we love the you know what i want franco remember the 70s so depressing yeah. and dark and taxi driver give, and give me network <laughs> network and fucking depression <laughs> uh, no but everyone loves the 80s right the 80s bright lights neon, neon. ghostbusters um so we're in the period of reagan, the 80s. reagan. <laughs> contra. No. <laughs> we forget that part from <laughs> And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I'm shocked I'm saying it. I don't know what's got into me. Maybe a ghost got into me watching this film. But I think most of the nostalgia here really works. I'm shocked. I really believe most of the nostalgia here actually works. Um, I think this is a fine film. I think the final third of the movie especially really picks up the pace. And there are some actually really fun moments of ghost Boston because Boston makes me feel good. good. <laughs> uh, I think, like we commented about in the trailer, Franco, and you know, we, we instantly noticed this: the uh, the whole freezing horror element are actually surprisingly really, really well done and lead to some pretty impressive horror elements, which I was shocked to see in a kids' film, a film that is clearly made for kids. Um, so that was surprising and surprising in a good way. I know a lot of people didn't actually like that part. I liked it. I was like, yes, give me more of this. <laughs> this is what I want, right? And I was glad to see those horror elements, uh, which actually might lead to some scenes which kids, I don't know if I it would might, want they, my they really young kids to see. Terrifying, right? Mm. Because you've got scenes with, with, you know, these massive icicles sticking out of people. Obviously, no blood or anything, but still quite some... You know what? Good, good on them for being brave enough to do that. Frozen Empire is overstuffed, but it has a satisfying ending. Uh, that's that's exactly my thoughts, Keith. That's my negative and my positive. I think the ending is great. I really like the ending. I think talking about the ending, I think this should be the ending, complete ending for Ghostbusters. I think this is the end of the line. Enough. You've done fine with afterlife you've done fine with frozen empire i think that's more than enough right to continue with another ghostbusters film would be stretching it too much um now this movie is too long i think this movie is way too long i think that midway through i honestly started to get a little bothered with this film thankfully like i said the final third of the film really picks up the pace and it really works you have so many different plot points I lost count of so many different relationship elements and Paul Rudd wants to be the dad and we've <laughs> got the young uh, kid, the young Spengler kid who forms a relationship with a ghost and we've got the old ones bringing back their magic and all these different plot points which is what Keith clearly is referring to by saying that it's over stuff. So many different plots, so many different characters, man. The cast is crowded as hell. <laughs> Um, another thing that I dislike, it's not dislike, but I think it's a pity. Ghost, Ghostbusters, a... Ghostbusters Endgame. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You've got a really talented young actor in film, Finn Wolfhard, and he has literally nothing to do in this whole movie. He's just there. Hey, you know, remember me from Stranger Things? Things. Yeah, I mean, Ghostbusters <laughs> as well. 80s. Like, give him something to do. He knows how to act. He's a, he's a good actor. We've seen him in, in Stranger Things. He can do this 80s stuff really well. But he does nothing. He literally has nothing to do. Nothing to do. <laughs> um, there are funny moments. Not too many. I want to laugh more in a Ghostbusters film. I laughed a few times here and there. Usually with the older with the older guys. 
I especially loved with Kamil Najiani, and that's one of the best things about this film. I think Kamil Najiani is really funny. He's a funny, funny actor. He's a talented dude. He knows his humor. He knows his comedic timing. He knows what he's good at, and he does that to the full. Um, what else? Overall, I had a fun, fun, fine time at the cinema. I would recommend it if you're a big fan of the Ghostbusters movies. I'm, I would recommend it if you want to take your kids to see a, a, a nice little movie. Um, um, I wouldn't recommend it if you're tired of the whole 80s, you know, schlock. You know, we've had lots of 80s schlock recently. This is just another one. It's a, it's a, I would say it's another three out of five for me today. Lots of trees out of five today for me. Yeah, very, very average. Um, it's, I would say this is above average, Franco. I would say this is above average because average is 2.5 for me. I would say this is above, slightly above average, a three out of five for me. It's fine. It's fine. It's watchable. I had a good time. Didn't mind it. Two hours of, of Ghostbusters fun. At the end of it, I'm like, it was fine. But I hope they don't make more Ghostbusters films. I think this is the end of the line, in my opinion. You, you, are you sure about that? <laughs> there's a whole, there's a whole team. The Ghostbusters now actually have a team or a whole production team behind them. So this is definitely not the last Ghostbusters film. You can be sure of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, but I had a decent time. I think there were some decent effects as well on the ghosts. Some of the action, or, you know, the action at the end was fine, fine, nothing out of this world. Franco. Sorry, because I'm, I'm. I was going to tell you we should go. No, no, nothing, nothing to comment. I have to. I think I'll watch this when I don't want. I don't want to think about the movie. I just want something light. And I, I, I sorry, but I was checking. I was checking like uh, what's showing, like Godzilla and Kong. Monkey Man is going to be shown. Yes, we've got Monkey Man to look forward to. Ah, first, um, forward first to. Omen. Civil, Civil War is getting some good, some good uh, reviews. Well, For Panda, though. I believe, releases in a few days. I'll go watch that. Um, Godzilla X Kong. Godzilla X Kong. Um, tell me, tell me, tell me when you're going. When yes, you're going we'll to go watch it. it Kong. I still have your book, by the way. I'll bring it with you. <laughs> You might, might immaculate. Yes, immaculate is going to be shown on the tenth. Um, the first omen on the fifth of April. Looking forward to that. Uh, immaculate you, they, on the tenth. Definitely you, will check that out. Just a second. Challengers. Ah, oh, they're going to show the Dark Knight again. Uh -huh, back to black coming out. We've got Monkey Man coming out on the seventeenth of April. We've got Civil War coming out on the nineteenth. Uh, Challengers on the twenty sixth. Dark, Dark Knight. What the hell? And you know what? I'm also looking forward to seeing. I think I'll go check it out in cinema. Star Wars Episode One: Phantom Menace. It's going to be shown in the cinema. <laughs> yeah, that's I think one of the first films I've ever watched in the cinema. Uh, Lala, tell us. Wait, uh, you know what we should do? Uh, like, and Bruce can can join us. We do the first omen, and then we watch Immaculate. Those are coming out together. No, so first omen fifth and immaculate tenth. But we could go and watch it was doing fifth together. And tenth depends on the podcast. Fifth and because I think I'll go watch it on the fifth uh, because then we'll have the podcast on the eighth. First, uh, first, uh, first omen. Yeah, and right. then tenth would be the week after. Ten would be Wednesday then. And then I want I'll... I I want the same experience I had with uh, what's it called with uh, Thanksgiving. All right. <laughs> I really want to watch another horror in cinema. Like, yeah. I really enjoyed myself last time. And apparently, uh, they said Immaculate is very, I believe they said very giallo, very giallo in style, with like the whole, you know, femme being. Look at the effects. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole, you know, you know, obviously the lots of blood and the whole, you know, sexualized female figure in it. Uh, which is good. Sounds Listen, good. The, what what did the Christian say? Not did the Christian say. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> the final wait. third of the film is wow. Right. Wait, I'm wait, very wait. much looking forward to that. We've got lots of good movies coming up, viewers and listeners. Um, I hope you're looking forward to watching all these films and listening to our reviews and discussions. I'm very much looking forward to talking about them as well on the podcast. Did you find the comments, Franco? I'm coming soon. Left Google to go. In the to meantime, Vian. Franco, this week we will be releasing our your, well, your interview because I was sick. Your interview with 
the director of Tiger Stripes. Tiger Stripes, Nell. What's her surname, Franco? Nell, Amanda, you, Amanda, Amanda Nell, Nell you. you. Amanda Nell You. So we will be releasing our, uh, well, Franco's interview with Amanda Nell You, director of Tiger Stripes, which was, um, which was the Malaysian uh, film, uh, which was selected for, obviously, the best international film at the latest Academy Awards. Um, released in Malaysia, um, and she talks about censorship in Malaysia, um, Franco and uh, Amanda Nelly discuss her, her kind of like what inspired her, what are her favorite directors, like different films she has enjoyed watching recently. Lots of discussions about our main protagonist and, and how the interpretation of the, our, our main protagonist, the young kid. Uh, what's her name, Franco? Do you remember the name of the kid? Z uh, Zafar. 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 Uh, kind of like how, how, you know, how controversial that is in Malaysia. Right, it's a very interesting discussion, and I hope viewers and listeners, you will check out the interview. I'll try and release it uh, Thursday. I'll try and release it on Thursday, so that will be a release on Thursday nice. because I'll have time to edit it on uh, Wednesday, Wednesday morning, and Thursday I will release it. Um, Franco, so, immaculate, immaculate Christian Twitter has spoken. Diabolical, sacrilegious, and pure evil, and grossly offensive. It is profane. And there's a third deck that spits in the face of all that is holy, just evil. So it's good to watch during I Holy Week in Malta. Sorry. <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, and I, we are definitely looking forward to checking out Immaculate. And with that, Franco, I think we can end the podcast. Good two hours, as always. Always a blast talking about films with you. And I'm so happy we have this podcast. And we can talk yeah. about films and series uh, together. Funnily enough, this is episode 66. We're missing yes. another six. <laughs> yes, talking about the omen and, and <laughs> immaculate um, and so many other horrific. And we love the horrific. We yeah. love the horrific. <laughs> uh, so, viewers and listeners, let us know about all these movies and series we've talked about. Have you watched? Three Body Problem, have you watched the latest Ghostbusters? Have you watched Quiet On Set? Have you watched Roadhouse? Have you watched Stop Motion? Let us know in the comment section below with your thoughts about those films and let us know if you are enjoying the podcast. And if you are, leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe, let your friends and family know how much you're enjoying the podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback. And with that, we can end the podcast. Thank you, Franco, as always. Thank you, Andrea. Loved. Thank you to our viewers and listeners. And with that, Ciao, ciao. Free Palestine. <laughs>